Hello, everybody. Can you all hear me OK? Mic on? Cool. Uh, welcome to reInvent. Is this, how many people's first session is this today? How many people just got in and registered this morning? OK, a few people. Um, well, welcome to, to reInvent 2017. I hope your first session for the rest of you was, was productive and informative. Uh, this session is going to be using AWS Lambda as a security team. My name is Andrew Baird. I'm a solutions architect out of our Atlanta office for AWS, joined by a colleague of mine, Brittany, who will be speaking at the, the latter half of the presentation. Uh, the two of us work together in Atlanta uh, with some of our larger customers to help them design their architectures on AWS to follow best practices. Uh, large companies, like you know, many of you all in the audience, are probably very security conscious. So security is a great topic of conversation. And each of us has a development background. So as soon as AWS Lambda was released uh, by AWS a few years ago, and as it's grown in its uh, number of event sources and its capabilities, uh, the ways in which security teams can leverage Lambda has just you know, grown significantly. So uh, we see a lot of different security teams take advantage of Lambda as a way to you know, revolutionize and modernize their security practices. And the point of the presentation today is to kind of help the folks in the room um, to kind of join that wave and, and understand a lot of the different ways you can, you can utilize Lambda as a security team. Um, so the topics that we're going to go over today, uh, we're going to give you an overview of uh, different security topics, kind of the, the, the reasons of why we think Lambda fits into the security team uh, responsibility so well, some of the benefits that it brings that um, will be of a, you know, specific value to security teams. And then we're going to talk about three different areas of security. We're going to talk about auditing, we're going to talk about monitoring, we're going to talk about remediation and the ways in which Lambda can fit into um, those three different pillars of your security team operations. Uh, and, and how you know, different architecture patterns and a demo with each of those for, for how Lambda can be leveraged. So security engineering, uh, typically in the past, has been, uh, you know, in the, the legacy models, have been very focused on documents, spreadsheets, policy documents, documenting you know, the different IT controls that your applications have to adhere to, um, the different processes that teams need to follow in order to gain approval to make changes, very policy focused, very document focused. Uh, and, as we've gone into kind of more modern practices, as your architectures and your infrastructures um, have you know, been built to a different scale, the amount of elasticity that um, you know, your applications are capable of taking advantage of, security engineering has become part of development. There's a lot of development activities that need to take place as part of security. Um, so there's been a lot of work that probably a lot of the folks in the room here have done over the past few years to take their security policy documents, uh, whatever compliance frameworks your organization maps to, and create systems, write code, use tools um, to make sure that the, the, the software that your teams are building, that your organization is using, is following and adhering to all the policies you have set. Um, so there's been a transition of, of documents to, to code and artifacts. Now the whole point of the security engineering organization is to make sure that the data that your co company is storing on behalf of your customers, that the, the systems that your teams are building are built in a secure way, that the data of those customers is safe, and the way in which a lot of this is achieved is through building systems that introduce server-based infrastructure. So um, there's a, the possibility that as you continue to build uh, more and more systems to monitor and enforce the policies of your organization, you're also, you know, at the same time introducing more and more systems that both have to be patched, have to be paid for, have to be monitored have to be protected. Um, a lot of different customers that are building with the server-based solutions and their approach to security are introducing a lot of components that become very attractive targets to you know, malicious attacks. Um, so wouldn't it be a great thing if you could kind of achieve the same goals that you're pursuing with writing code and building systems to enforce your policies without having to worry about any of the, the, the different burdens that servers introduce into your architecture? Um, so that's where Lambda comes in. Uh, so there's no infrastructure to manage, and all the things that come with not managing infrastructure, all those benefits I was alluding to, not having to, not having to patch those servers, not having to operationalize you know, all the processes around those servers, not having to provision them, not having to pay for them when they're not being used. You're only paying for what you use. So a lot of different cases, um, the security software that you're deploying on your server-based infrastructure could require some pretty hefty compute. Um, it could require some pretty heavy licensing uh, within, the, within the operating system. So the idea that you could achieve the same type of policy enforcement uh, and security operations um, through something like Lambda, where you're, you're not paying for any idle compute time, can be a really big you know, cost reduction driver um, for your security organization. Uh, the last benefit, bring your own code. Um, so you get the, the concept of, of still working with the modern, you know, high-level 
programming languages that um, there's a ton of best practices, a lot of tools that um, you know, natively work with those languages. You can still bring your own code, build your own logic, enforce your own policies through that code um, with Lambda. There's not too many restrictions at all um, for the type of you know, handlers you're going to build, the type of logic you're going to write inside of Lambda. So really flexible um, to achieve whatever logic your security enforcement requirements are. Um, all of the benefits around not managing infrastructure. Um, a lot of times security teams you know, don't have the large operational budgets that your business application teams have. So being able to reduce that operational burden could be a big work-life balance win for your security team. And all the cost effectiveness of, of not having to pay for ongoing server time is a huge benefit too. Um, so really high level, just in case there's folks in the rooms who in the room who haven't uh, haven't used Lambda yet, um, the, tip, the kind of generalized architecture that Lambda sits within looks like this. Um, so Lambda is at the center there, and you'll create what's called a function. Uh, and a Lambda function contains all of the code, the logic that you've written, uh, and any time that Lambda function runs, whichever, whatever code you've uploaded to the function will execute. The way in which that code is executed is defined by the event sources. So there's a, a few dozen different event sources that are available on AWS today, and it's, a, it's an area of the services that continues to grow. Um, so it could be as changes are occurring in your environment, maybe it's you know, data arriving in an S3 bucket, maybe it's a new bucket that was created, changes to a security group. Um, all of those things can translate through one service or another into an event that can be sent to your Lambda function and trigger an invocation. Um, so you, once you've configured the code you've written and created a Lambda function and defined what its triggers are as event sources, that Lambda function will run any time those events have occurred within the environment. And then your Lambda function is free to reach out to any other services that it needs to. Um, so again, it's your code. You've got you know, free control over the, over the runtime environment for whatever language you've written your function in. So whatever your function needs to do to uh, check compliance requirements, to you know, remediate configuration changes that you've deemed aren't compliant, to monitor the environment and audit it, your Lambda function and the code you write is free to do those things. OK, so I'm going to kick it off with our first demo. Uh, so uh, this is just going to be a hypothetical situation. Um, a typical developer that might exist within your organization. Maybe it's, maybe it's you, an, an administrator, who um, you know, runs into a couple roadblocks and cuts some corners. So um, I'm going to switch over to my laptop here. Um, so I, as a developer, I have a reason, whatever that reason may be. I need to debug something in a, in a production database. Uh, I have admin credentials within this account. And so I'm going to try and log into my Bastion host. We've got a Bastion host, great security practice. I'm not going to directly connect to a database in production from my laptop. So we're going to go through a Bastion host. So um, I'm going to go in and open my terminal here and try and connect to it. And it's going to hang. OK, right, we have good security policies. My Bastion host hasn't whitelisted my IP address. Let me back out of here get into the console, find my security group for the Bastion, and whitelist my specific IP address. So let's go through that step. And I, as, a, I, as an administrator, I'm already kind of like, this is taking more time than it should. So um, I'm beginning to you know, think about my deadlines and how I have a meeting in 15 minutes. So let's uh, add a rule. It's going to be an SSH rule. OK, port 22. We're going to grab my IP address. We're going to save it. All right. Let's uh, get back into the terminal here. Try again. All right, we're in. Cool. OK, now let's do connect to MySQL database. Let's enter the password. Oh, it's hanging. Another security group. I need to update it. OK, let's, uh, let's back out of here. So I need to make sure now I'm talking about production database. I'm in the bastion. I think I need to go into the RDS security group. Let's uh, update it. I'm going to add a rule. The MySQL port. Just SSHing. Just, it, just so I didn't have to remember the Elastic IP. Okay. Yep. The question was, what else is that script doing? Um, so it's just, just retaining the SSH. Um, so I'm going to save it. And you know what? I don't want to have to come back here just in case I forget how this whole thing works. I'm going to edit this security group. And it's just for a minute here. I'm going to go back and. Uh, you know, don't tell anybody. I'm just going to open this up to the world uh, just for a minute. I'm going to change it. Don't worry. I'm going to change it back. And uh, then we're going to get back here to my terminal, enter my password, enter the wrong password. So let me enter it again. 
Nine men. Okay, I'm in my database now. You can say, you know, I show my tables. Remember semicolon. So databases. Okay, I'm in. All right, so uh, now I got to run to my meeting, and you know I'll come back to this and remember probably in the rest of my day that I just opened a production database open to the world. So um, let's hope that I remember that. But you know, not necessarily a malicious attempt to do anything within the account, but developers that have access that maybe aren't aware of all the changes that they're making, very you know possible that they could misconfigure something, and you know without being a malicious actor, left a door open. Um, so let's jump back into our presentation. All right. All right, so now we're going to talk about the three different uh, pillars. We're going to start with auditing. Uh, so forget that, you know, I left the door wide open. That's probably going to be fine for now, you know, just, just assume it's okay. Um, so typical goals when teams are auditing. Um, th these are the questions that we hear teams typically want to answer when they want to audit their environment. They want to know what's the state of my environment right now. They want to know whatever state it's in, when did it last change. They want to know. Who changed it? If there's a question I have about the state that it's in and how it got there, who, who made that state change? And then how can I trust this record of state? Um, how can I know that what's being reported to me as a state actually reflects what's implemented in reality? And the, the types of mechanisms that um, companies usually you know, pursue and implement in order to answer those questions are listed here. You know, they, they generate a lot of logs, they archive them so that they can triage them and look at you know, changes that are made through the logs. They've got some type of change management database that lists all the configuration information for their details in their environment. They have some type of process that ensures the only people that are making changes that get reflected in the CMDB um, were approved as part of a process. And then there's a lot of really tight access control. The type of people that can make changes to the environment are, are very tightly you know, restricted into a select group of people. Okay. Uh, at the center of all of those things is this, this presence of audit logs. Um, so, Within that old type of model where it's very policy driven, policy document driven, and a, a lot of process and around um, who on your team members are allowed to make changes and a lot of approvals around those change, um, we see customers that were able to be you know, mildly successful having audit logs that you know, fit those top three bullet points, that um, you know, they're the outputs of some uh, you know, ticketing system internally that's capturing the request for what the change to the environment was, and that's treated like an audit log. Um, Changes that are made out of band when an operational issue happens, people can kind of cut through the process and leave inaccuracies within their environment. And there's a lot of customers that like to capture everything, all of the details and data that's um, you know, changing within their environment. When it's time to go through an audit and understand if their environment is compliant against whatever framework they're being held against, uh, there's a lot of noise they have to sift through. There's a ton of different data. And what audit logs should really get down to be is, is these things. They should be immutable. Whenever these logs are generated, they should, you should know and have confidence that those logs can never be changed. They should be coupled with reality. So the changes that are occurring within your environment, they should be the things creating the artifacts that are logged. They should not be part of a process output um, documented in, 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 in a literal document. Um, it should have been triggered out of something that occurred within the environment itself. And they should be compliance focused. So um, if you're actually planning, planning for an audit, your organization gets audited, whether it be internally by a team or against the, against the framework, uh, it's a great idea to make sure that all of your audit logs are you know, sifted through so that when it comes time to you know, go through an attestation, uh, that you have a very condensed set of you know, condensed testimony that you're really you know, achieving your compliance um, from the audit logs because there's not a lot of noise there. Um, so the reason why the typical process kind of falls short now if you create audit logs in the way it did, if this is a process that sounds familiar, um, it probably isn't going to scale very well. So you have a security engineer who needs to audit the environment, and they need to answer the question, what's changed? Has anything changed in my environment since I last looked? And if the answer to that question is no, then, then you're kind of doing it wrong. Um, so you're doing it wrong in a couple different ways. And this is a reference to an old text-based adventure game where um, you couldn't really you know, adventure in the dark, and if you tried, this you know, fantastical beast would, would, you know, you would meet your demise. Um, so if, if you're checking your environment so frequently in AWS that changes aren't occurring between those checks, it either means, one, you're spending too much manual time reviewing your environment, or two, you're not letting your teams take advantage of all the agility and elasticity that's, that AWS enables for them. So realistically, it's going to look more like this. If your teams are able to take advantage of the features that we give them, something changed. And what changed? Everything probably changed. All of the things can change in your environment between two different checks. So if you want to really revolutionize the way that you're going to um, you know, perform auditing activities within your account, 
uh, it should be a process that, that more typically looks like this. And rather than having a person exist at the front of this question, you've got software, you've got code, you've got a Lambda function um, that's going to execute and answer these questions within its code and be an extension of the decision-making processes that your team has. So as a change occurs, we're going to evaluate, does the change that just occurred meet the compliance requirements that we've set forth for our organization? If the answer is, uh, if the answer is yes, then the change is comp if, if something changed and it's apl applicable to our compliance framework and it's compliant, let's just archive it. Um, if the change that just occurred is not compliant, something happened and you need to take action, whether that means alert somebody, whether it means to mark that resource as not compliant, whether it's you know, wake somebody up in the middle of the night because a security issue may have just happened. Um, all of these things and questions can be answered and, and uh, addressed through code. All right, so the different services that allow you to perform these auditing activities and write those Lambda functions that have that type of, you know, that type of state machine and answer those questions. So first, uh, AWS CloudTrail and CloudWatch logs and config and config rules. And I'll kind of step through them uh, in a second. And these slides will be available too, so don't worry if I skip through a photo before you take a picture. Um, so CloudTrail is, is your audit log of all of your AWS activity um, for, all the, for all the services that are supported by the service. Any API calls that are made, there will be an event trail of all of those calls that occur um, so that uh, you can see all of the events that happened over time, uh, all of the API calls that have been made. CloudWatch logs is a service where you, either your application logs you can forward to the service, or there's a number of different AWS service logs that natively uh, outport logged uh, data to CloudWatch logs, where you can create a subscription to a Lambda function and have all of those logs be processed by a Lambda function you write. So as those uh, logs are processed, you can evaluate each log statement if anything suspicious happens, a particular exception, maybe an access denied, those kind of things. You'll be able to create a CloudWatch logs subscription from a Lambda function to, to evaluate those things. Uh, AWS config um, is a little bit analogous to a change management database on AWS, but because of the scale and the elasticity that you work with on top of AWS, uh, it's, it's got the ability to show you all of the changes that occurred to a particular resource that's been discovered by the service over time. And as those changes occur, uh, not only will it record the configuration changes, but you can also trigger what are called config rules. And those config rules themselves will be Lambda functions. And those Lambda functions can look at the configuration change that's just occurred to a resource and decide if it's compliant or not. Um, so that change could be somebody's updated an S3 bucket policy, uh, somebody's launched a new EC2 instance, and you're not sure if the tag matches your standards, uh, somebody's created a volume, and, and it should be encrypted, and you can evaluate its configuration to see if it's encrypted. So config is a service that you can plug in to retrieve all of the uh, resource and configuration changes that are happening within your account. And as those changes occur, automatically trigger a Lambda function that you've written to evaluate that change. And whether you're in an organization where your account has you know, thousands upon thousands of configuration changes a day, or uh, an account where maybe it's for you know, personal use, or it's a smaller business, or it's the type of configuration where it's mission critically important to your business, like the policy for an S3 bucket that contains you know, private customer information, but the policy for it should not change very often. Um, so whether it's either one of those two states, you'll get a lot of benefit from using Lambda because either it will scale to the level that you need, uh, regardless of how frequently those changes are occurring, or you're not going to be paying for idle compute time, even though you've written a rule that's going to let you know anytime somebody's changed that mission critical S3 buckets policy, it may never run, and you're never going to pay for that Lambda function unless, it does, unless that configuration does change. Um, so really, really compelling scaling uh, mechanism here and cost, effect cost effectiveness when using Lambda for this type of uh, architecture. Uh, and the last one for auditing that's become really popular, uh, really popular for a lot of different security teams on AWS is using Lambda as the auditor itself, is to deploy this kind of architecture where you as a security team own your own account and it has federation credentials, federation rights into all of the other applications uh, accounts within your organization. That Lambda function will, you know, one by one through the uh, security token service APIs, uh, get AWS credentials to those accounts, and then call APIs within that account to describe resources, to remediate, you know, configurations as needed. And that Lambda function is, you know, code that's fully written by you and owned by you, uh, and you've got free reign over all of those other application uh, accounts within your organization. So they don't need to worry about deploying your code or maintaining it within their own accounts. You operate within your own account with rights to federate into their account. So this is a really popular model. Okay. 
All right, demo, let's jump into it. So let's get back to, uh, I'm back from my meeting, and let's jump here, let's see what's occurred. So um, this demo architecture I just had on the screen is gonna show you the, the security group changes you watched me make, and I've set up a config rule in the background. So if I go to the config service, <coughs> I've defined specific policies that have said, um, there's only one specific IP address or one security group that I'm allowing uh, my security group to be open to for that database. If I see that production database have a security group change that allows access to any other security group other than its application tier, I'm gonna mark it not compliant. Um, so within the config service, I've got a rule created. It's called whitelist the MySQL security group. And what I've configured here is config lets me narrow down the scope of my configuration change uh, triggers down to the specific resource that I care about. Um, so I'm gonna trigger this Lambda function to run anytime a resource of type security group experiences a change, but specifically only for security groups that match this specific identifier. So that's a security group resource identifier for um, that, that database's security group. Uh, I've got a couple parameters here I've listed, the port that I care about, and this is the approved security group, it's application tier. Uh, they're gonna be sent to a Lambda function that I've written and the Lambda function is gonna get the configuration for that security group, evaluate its new state, and then mark it compliant or not compliant. So it makes a call back to the config service and declares it compliant or not compliant. So in this case, I made a change that was clearly not compliant. So now as a security team, if I wanted to see the state of the environment today, I could come to the config service and notice that, hey, there's a security group that's not compliant right now. I better take a look at it. And even though that feels like, you know, uh, there's a manual process there, you don't have to stop there. You don't have to just mark it as not compliant. Um, the config as a service also lets you create, uh, uh, push all the configuration changes to SNS topics. So if you wanna utilize SNS topics as a place where you continue to do more processing against configuration updates that have happened, if you'd like SNS to, to send you emails, if you'd like that Lambda function config rule to perform some other action rather than just mark it non-compliant, you'll be able to do that. Um, so one example of using Lambda within another service that's security focused um, to, to, to mark changes that have occurred as, as not compliant, okay? All right, let's jump back to the presentation. All right, that was the demo. All right, so recap on auditing. Uh, so remember that there's two services that are really mission critical whenever you wanna be able to audit your AWS environment, and you should have them enabled in every region, in every account, that's the best practice we recommend, and that's CloudTrail and Config. If you want to be able to, you know, at the time of triage, go into either one of those services and see real changes that have occurred, um, you're going to need to have those services enabled. And all of the other services that generate logs, uh, we have CloudWatch logs capabilities to have those logs be sent to CloudWatch. Um, so it's really important that you uh, subscribe to those service logs with, Cloud, with CloudWatch logs and create Lambda functions to consume them and do whatever interesting actions you'd like to perform within CloudWatch logs. Uh, all of the logs that do generate, it's important that you persist them. There's really cool capabilities in Glacier where you can write once to ensure that nobody's got the ability to affect that data once it's been written. Great for audit logs. Uh, S3 obviously has bucket policies where you're able to ensure that nobody has, has write permissions other than whatever's, you know, the, the role that's assigned to your Lambda function that's actually performing the writes um, to, a particular, to a particular bucket. So setting up your policies, setting up your, your lifecycle rules within S3 to make sure that um, Nobody's able to, to, to change your audit logs once they're stored. And the big key here is to take all the audit logs that are generated, all the different log sources between your applications, between uh, the AWS services and services like Config and CloudTrail, is to have them play an active role within your environment. Don't just treat them as something that gets retained and archived for some later operational manual process. Make them be an active input into an event-driven decision for your security team because that's what's gonna let you scale and that's what's gonna let your policy scale inside an environment on top of AWS that's gonna be elastically changing uh, 24 by seven and rather than having to wake up potentially in the middle of the night when those changes occur, just let that code make decisions for you at three, at three in the morning and you can, you can sleep easy. So last bonus I'm gonna call out uh, Capital One has a great open source project that really follows what I've kind of described here um, for you know, security best practices using Lambda. It's called Cloud Custodian. Um, so take a look at that project they made available. Um, if you, you want to stand on the shoulders of others, that's a great project and a great, great place to start. All right, thanks, Andrew.
So I'm Brittany, and we're going to spend the second half of this talk talking about um, how you can use Lambda to help with your security, security monitoring, as well as your security remediation. So everybody today probably has a SOC. That SOC consists a lot of tools, mostly that are combing through a bunch of logs, trying to find that needle in the haystack that's really important to your organization. And they're trying to figure out what's important to your organization, but without a lot of context for your business or your infrastructure, right? And you probably have a bunch of people watching those screens, waiting for that needle in the haystack to pop up. One of the, the biggest problems, one of the biggest concerns we hear today is just this information overload, all this data that you have to, to comb through as a security team. And what are you really getting out of this, right? Like, how much insight are you really obtaining from all of these false positives that are probably driven by these logs and these alerts that your security team is now spinning up to try and go figure out, is that really something I need to worry about? Is it not something I need to worry about? And as you start to look at AWS and at the scale and the speed at which people will be able to use the infrastructure, it starts to become an automated kind of thing that you have to automate your security monitoring. You can't wait for, oh, you know, it used to be somebody racked and stacked it, and it was a very manual process to kind of get that into your monitoring tools. And now it has to be an automated way, and you have to have automation set up so that you can see when infrastructure changes and you can see all those changes. And Lambda can help you do that. And we're gonna look at some of the security monitoring tools that we provide in AWS and how Lambda can help you filter out some of the noise and get the information that's, that's gonna be important to your organization. So before we dive into the integration points with each, each of these services, we're gonna just really quick touch on the services that are gonna be important to most security teams. So a lot of these Andrew already touched on, so I'll keep it brief. Um, we have Amazon CloudWatch, so everybody should be familiar with that, right? It's what allows you to monitor your resources in AWS. Um, part of Amazon CloudWatch is Amazon CloudWatch Logs. So as Andrew already mentioned, CloudWatch Logs allow you to, allows you to aggregate and filter log data. That could be log data from your applications. It could be log data from your servers. Um, it could be other log data that we'll also look at in a minute. And there's also Amazon CloudWatch events. So again, he already touched on this, but CloudWatch events allows you to get event-driven notifications of changes that are happening to your AWS resources, and you can react to those via Lambda. Next, we have CloudTrail. So again, that's your audit trail for any API calls that are happening within your AWS infrastructure. And the last one on that first row is VPC flow logs. So VPC flow logs gives you um, gives you kind of like a, a NetFlow type log that shows you accept and reject traffic happening within your VPC, right? So if traffic has been accepted or rejected to a particular ENI and Elastic Network interface within your VPC, it will show you that log within VPC flow logs. And so you can determine um, was that, you know, was that rejected based on a NACL that I have set up or a security group that I have set up, et cetera. Lastly, at the bottom is Amazon Macy. Um, it's a new service. Some people may be familiar with it, some may not be. Um, it came out a little bit earlier this year. It's a really powerful service. If you haven't looked at it, I definitely suggest um, taking a look, and we'll dive into it a little bit more in, um, in a minute, but essentially what it gives you is it's a security monitoring service that um, uses machine learning. And it combines not only user access patterns to your data, but it combines that with a data classification of that data. So an understanding of how critical that data is to your business so that it's only alerting you on things that are really important, data that's really important to your business that's being accessed in an anomalous way. So it helps to kind of filter out some of that noise. So if we start to look at some of the integration patterns for each of these services and how Lambda can be used with each of them. With CloudWatch events and CloudWatch logs, we already kind of mentioned that those can kick off Lambda functions to, um, that are based on either the events or the logs coming in, right? And those Lambda functions today, you could just forward them directly to your monitoring tools that you currently have, but again, that just kind of adds to the noise that you already have. It adds to the data crush that you're already experiencing. So with Lambda, again, it's just code, right? But it's code that you write. You who know your infrastructure, you who know your business. 
you're able to write this code. And with this code, you can add context to the logs that you're getting or the events that you're getting. You can add, um, you can also filter stuff out, right? So besides the context, and that context could be, um, I know my corporate IP range. And so for anything within this corporate IP range, I don't care about that, it's cool. You don't have to, you don't have to alert on that. You can filter that out, right? Um, you could also call out to other AWS APIs and get more information on the event that occurred. So similarly with CloudTrail, CloudTrail logs get um, delivered to an S3 bucket and you can kick off a Lambda function when a new object lands in an S3 bucket. So when a new, um, a new delivery of Cloud, CloudTrail logs gets delivered to S3, then that can invoke a Lambda function. And that Lambda function can then inspect those logs. It can add context to those logs. It can filter them, et cetera. And then forward on what's important to your existing SOC tools. Next, again, similarly, is VPC flow logs. So VPC flow logs, um, you can set up to go to a CloudWatch logs. Uh, log stream, and then from there you set up a subscription for that log stream. And that log stream subscription can go to an AWS Lambda function, which again can add context and filter. And we'll actually demo some of this in just a minute and some of the context that you might want to add to your VPC flow logs. And lastly, we have Macy. So I already kind of touched on this, but to just kind of dive into this a little bit more, there's really two pieces to Macy. And the first is the natural language processing. So given access that you grant to the Macy service, it will look at your S3 data and actually classify that data. So if there's PII data in your S3 bucket, um, it will be able to classify that and understand that that's PII data. It's very important to you. Um, and it will, obviously, <laughs> it will classify that as very business critical to your, um, to your business. And then it combines that information about the classification of that data with information about how that data is accessed. So it's not just how one particular user is accessing it, it actually starts to build up groups of users. And it starts to understand who are similar users, who are like users, and if one user starts acting anonymous, anom anomalously, <laughs> anomalously, <laughs> um, outside of the, the normal group that they're in, on data that's very critical to your business, then it will alert you. And it has different, um, different levels of alerts, right? So very critical for if they're doing it against critical business data versus a lower level alert if it's against data that's not as critical. And again, you can forward um, any alerts that come out of the Macy service. So you can forward to CloudWatch events and to Lambda and then obviously to your SOC tools. But additionally, Amazon Macy comes with its own dashboard that you can also use as well. So a really, um, really cool dashboard that actually lets you drill into the different types of data that are being stored in S3, um, the different types of users. So if you see up there on the right, you have, um, you have different types of users and the, the different APIs calls that they're making, and it'll actually map them against, um, <clears throat> against the map as well. So you can see like where the calls are coming from and things. Okay, so I mentioned um, a few minutes ago that we're gonna look at how you could add context to some of your VPC flow logs and, and what you might wanna use Lambda for. So in the previous one, I, I showed you that you know, VPC flow logs can go into Amazon CloudWatch logs, from there Lambda and then to your SOC tools. In this demo, um, we're gonna use Amazon Elasticsearch with Kibana that sits on top of it as kind of a, a stand-in replacement for what you would consider your SOC tools because it has a really nice visualization and dashboard. So um, let me pop over to my laptop here. All right. Oh, that was fun. Okay, so let me back up for a second and kind of show you how I got in here. So I have my, um, I have my CloudWatch logs here, and from here I click on my VPC flow logs, um, log stream that I've created. So within that VPC flow log, um, or within that CloudWatch log stream, I have, um, I have different log streams for each of the ENIs that it's been monitoring. 
And so if I click on one of these ENIs, and I can see all the different, you can see all the different accepts and rejects and all the different VPC flow logs that are coming in here. And I'll expand one of these just so you can see what it consists of. It, it's, it's pretty bare bones, right? So it's got the ENI, it's got a source IP, a destination IP, it's got source port, um, destination port, et cetera. But besides that, you don't have a lot of additional information. So what we've done here is we've actually utilized Lambda to help decorate these logs, to make additional calls out to see what security groups are associated with that ENI. Where is that IP coming from that actually made that call? And so you can see over here on the right, I have a bunch of different people. Some people from Russia have decided to try to get into my instance. Some people from Poland um, have tried to access my instance, et cetera, right? Um, and if you scroll down here and look at one of these individual logs, this is what's actually being passed into Elasticsearch. And again, Elasticsearch is a stand-in for your SOC tool. So this is what could be passed into your SOC tool or any additional data that you wanted to, to um, add and decorate that log with, you could pass in. And you could also, again, filter out so it was only getting the stuff that's really important to you. So you can see here that we've added in not only the security group IDs, um, if there were multiple security groups associated with the instance, it would have all of those listed out there. Um, but you can also see that it's done a lookup on the IP to see where it's coming from, et cetera. So just a really quick demo to kind of show you what some of the possibilities are for how you can add context and, um, and kind of decorate some of your logs that are being generated out of the AWS services to make more use out of them and send them to your existing SOC tools. So just to recap monitoring, we provide a lot of different tools, right? That doesn't mean you have to abandon the current tools that you're using, the current SOC tools that all your operations people are already familiar with and used to seeing. You can utilize Lambda to take that data and pass what's important onto your, onto your operations users. And then also make sure that you're passing on the data that's important, right? So don't add to the, the influx of data that they're having to look through and comb through. All right, so next is remediation. I think we all know what remediation means, right? It means fixing what's broken. It also means getting that text in the middle of the night and trying to not trip over a million things as you find your computer and not wake somebody else in the house up. And then you're trying to fix it, and you're trying to fix it really fast. But this doesn't work anymore. With AWS, not only the scale and speed that you're going to be working with does that not work, but it also becomes really, really costly for that to be such a manual process that you're having to get people out of bed every time an alert goes off. But also, the rate at which attacks happen today just makes this not feasible to be a manual process anymore. And it means that remediation has to be something that you're automating now. So we've already talked about kind of how you can funnel things from these different services through to Lambda. So we've talked about how VPC flow logs can go to Amazon CloudWatch logs, how Macy can go to CloudWatch events, We've talked about how CloudTrail and Config and CloudWatch all can generate or can invoke Lambda and, and make a Lambda function um, be created, not created, invoked. <laughs> and from there, we've talked about how you can use that Lambda function to do auditing, to do monitoring, et cetera. But one of the things you can also do, and Andrew mentioned this, is you can also do remediation. So you can also have that Lambda function make changes to your infrastructure. It can call other AWS APIs. It can make calls to change what was just changed, to undo the changes that were just made if you disagree with them, right? And again, that's all gonna be based on your business rules and your infrastructure. One of the other things we haven't touched on, but if you're not familiar with it, um, it also feeds into CloudWatch and can also be utilized in the same manner as our AWS WAF service, so it's our web application firewall. Um, any, any rules that you set up within the WAF service 
generate metrics within Amazon CloudWatch, and via those metrics, you can set up alarms so that if, um, if a rule passes an alarm threshold, then you can, um, you can have it kick off a Lambda function so that you, can do, um, you could do remediation, or you could actually call to make a, a change to your WAF rule if you wanted to. So what if the problem doesn't lie in an AWS API, though? A lot of times, remediation means logging into a host, running some scripts, making some changes. So how do you do that, and how do you do that with Lambda? One of the ways you can do that is with what we call EC2 Systems Manager, and it has a feature called Run Command. And Run Command actually allows you to execute scripts on a host, and it can execute scripts on one to many hosts. So if there's multiple hosts that you want to execute the script on, um, it, can, it can execute it on all of those EC2 instances. Um, but it doesn't require any need to SSH or RDP into the host. You don't have to um, give your operations people access to your production instances. So we always talk about removing access to those production instances, right? Which obviously <laughs> in our bad actor demo, that bad Andrew, um, <laughs> we, we didn't practice what we preached, right? But um, one of the ways that you can, you can do this is by using run command and by making sure that you're removing that access and putting all those scripts that they're going to run anyways. You usually know what scripts they're going to run and what, um, what commands they're going to run. You can put those in, in scripts and then have them run via run command. One of the things, though, that comes up is Lambda can run for a five-minute time period, right? And what happens if your remediation either is going to take a little longer than that or um, perhaps it's just a bunch of different steps. You know, the, the concept behind Lambda is they're, they're microservices, they're, they're functions, right? They should, they should do their function, they should do it well. Um, you don't want to cram too much into a single function. So what if you have to, via remedi in order to remediate, what if you have to run multiple functions and you need to string those together? Well, that's where AWS Step Functions comes in. So with Step Functions, you can actually coordinate the calling of different Lambda functions. And what this looks like, so it's really easy um, JSON code that you define to say call this step, then call this one, then call this one. And those steps can be, um, can be Lambda functions. You can also do them in parallel. So if you have steps in your remediation that can be done in parallel, or you want to make branching decisions based on, um, based on your state data, you can do that as well. And one of the really cool things about it that most security organizations really like is that it also gives you a really nice audit log and a really nice visualization in the console that you see over there on the right of everything that happened in your execution. So you can see exactly what succeeded, exactly what failed. You get the input and output to every single step as well as to the state machine. So for our demo architecture here, we're gonna take a look back at the, um, the beginning bad actor demo that we did at the beginning and see what that security group looks like that Andrew opened up to the world. Okay. So if I come over here and look at the RDS security group, you'll see that the web server's there and the bastion host is there, but the from anywhere is now gone. So just in case anybody has amnesia and doesn't remember, we'll open it back up. I'm going to show you our setup that we have here. So within CloudWatch, we set up a CloudWatch event rule. And within that rule, it's listening to all API calls that happen for EC2. And I have a Lambda subscribed to that rule. And so that Lambda gets executed for any EC2 events that come through via CloudWatch events. And that Lambda function is pretty simple. It goes through and says, am I authorizing a security ingress? And if it's authorizing security ingress from anywhere, it removes it and revokes it. So if we go back here and I refresh, you can see that that security group is now gone. So it's pretty. Uh, heavy-handed <laughs> uh, example, but 
there's not many things that you would want to allow to be opened up to anywhere, right? And so there's rules like that that you probably have within your organization that only you know that you can code in really simple <coughs> Lambda functions. We're talking under 100 lines of code here that are applied to your account um, and can be utilized and can be utilized within your account for your infrastructure, for your business, for what makes sense for you. Okay. So that was the demo. So um, just to recap for remediation, um, with AWS, you definitely want to be automating your remediation. You want to take out as much manual processes as you can. Um, you want to make sure you're removing access to your operational production instances, right? So make sure that you're using run command for any kind of access that your operations people may need. And then finally, if you have multiple steps involved for remediation, then take a look at step functions for coordinating those. And you know, I didn't mention it on the step functions page, but one of the things you can do as well is you can string them together, but step functions also allows you to do um, error handling. So if there's some kind of failure within your Lambda function, you can, have it, um, you can have it kick off a different Lambda function that could actually alert someone to come and manually look at it. So you could try to do your automated remediation first, and then if that doesn't work, then you can bring in, bring in the big guns, right? So thank you for coming out today. Um, please remember to fill out your evaluations. Thanks.